Welcome, everyone. We're uh, going to start today's premier Pulse virtual series session. Uh, today's meetings on Pulse markets. These first, these virtual sessions are new for SBG and are opportunity to take our winter extension meetings online. My name is Brad Blackwell, and I'm a director with SAS Pulse Growers. I farm at Dinsmore, and I am your host for today. Forget today, we also incorporate a live question and answer session with speakers at the end of the presentation. So go to the questions box in the GoToWebinar app control panel, and we will address them in the question and answer discussion. Lastly, I want to thank today's session sponsor, Redhead Equipment. Thanks, Redhead. Your, your support is appreciated. Uh, today, we're going to open our session with some welcome remarks from Amber Johnson. She's the Director of Marketing and Communications with SAS Pulse Score. Amber? Thanks, Brad. Let me just get my slides going here. There we go. So we've spent uh, the last few recent weeks discussing how to better produce, increase yield, and drive adoption of pulse crops. But we know that we cannot simply produce more pulses. It's essential we prioritize market development to create sustainable demand for what you grow. Building demand by expanding the use of pulses through increased exports and diversified global markets and new market and end use opportunities is one of SPG's key strategic result areas. The Canadian pulse industry is working together to build new use markets for at least 25% of Canada's pulse production by the year 2025. To do this, we must first demonstrate the value pulses and pulse ingredients have to offer to food companies and end users, including their nutritional benefits and the role pulses play in sustainable food production. Work done in this area is mostly led by the team at Pulse Canada, with one focus area being led out of the SPG office as part of this national market development team. To ensure pulses are a profitable and sustainable option for all growers in Saskatchewan, we believe that building new and diversified demand is key to achieving that goal. Saskatchewan and Canada lead the world in exports and global trade of pulses, and we've seen in recent years how important it can be to have a wide variety of markets for the products we grow. Pea and lentil exports have been largely concentrated into a small number of large markets that can leave us vulnerable when market access shifts, underscoring the importance of diversification efforts. A great example of this importance of these market development efforts is the growth of the Chinese market for Canadian peas over time. China is currently the largest market for Canadian peas, far surpassing the volumes once shipped to India. In fact, pea exports to China have grown 500% over the last 10 years. Building the Chinese market was a priority of market development efforts for the past 15 years, and the Canadian industry worked extensively on increasing interest and demand for peas and pea ingredients for use in staple foods and in feed markets. Seeing the results of these efforts showcases the importance of long-term targeted work in market development. We're also excited to continue to see increased interest in companies processing pulses into pulse ingredients here in Canada. And we believe building the capacity for processing and fractionation here at home is an important piece of long-term sustainability, value creation and demand building for pulses, positioning Canada as the global hub for plant protein. A focus on pulses as ingredients and use in processing has been a focus for Can Canadian pulse market development for the past several years and it's promising to see this increased interest translate into new plants coming online both recently and into the future. We're also excited about diversification opportunities that we're currently focusing on that should translate into new demand for tomorrow. This includes work in areas like the U.S. food service sector, where we're working with commercial and non-commercial operators to increase the use of whole lentils on U.S. menus. And extensive work is also ongoing with food manufacturers to increase demand and market penetration for pea and lentil ingredients, including flours, protein, and starch used in cereal-based foods, batters and breadings, processed meat applications, meat and dairy alternatives, bakery items, as well as industrial and feed applications. And in order to take advantage of this new and diversified demand, we need to get products to market. Expanding and ensuring market access for growers and access to high functioning transportation and resolved trade barriers is another key result area for SPG and one that Pulse Canada leads efforts on behalf, on behalf of Canadian pulse growers. Their continued work in this area is essential to ensure trade barriers are mitigated and eliminated, retaining grower access to important crop production products and ensuring access to an efficient and reliable transportation system. 
Now, as we kick off our Premier Pulse virtual series session today, we're thankful for the opportunity to still connect with growers um, and agronomists virtually this year. And we look forward to connecting in person when we'll, we are able to again. But I'm confident that you will gain powerful insights today, highlighting key market opportunities for Pulse crops. Back to you, Brad. Thanks, Amber. Uh, it's good to know market development plans we've got in store for pea line ingredients. This information is great to keep in mind as we dive into our first market outlook with Jonathan Grieger. John is uh, going to be covering the latest market information for peas, fallow beans, and chickpeas today. Jonathan joined Left Field Commodity Research Team in September of 2019, adding his considerable expertise and experience. He, he attended the University of Manitoba where he has a Bachelor's of Science in Agribusiness and a Master's in Ag Economics. Currently, he's continuing studies towards a PhD. Jonathan. Great. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, uh, yeah, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the times we're in, uh, you know, we have to do this virtually, and it's great we have the technology and the ability to do this. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't replace you know, being able to, to have a coffee together, to connect with people, all those sorts of things, and, and look forward to the day when we can do that again. But uh, uh, we work with what we got, and, and so again, appreciate the opportunity, and these events are always very well organized with uh, with South Pulse Growers, and so so appreciate being a part of it. Uh, so, you know, for my talk here, I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, peas, chickpeas, and, and fava beans. And uh, I guess maybe one of, the, one of the first things I'll say is, is, you know, there's a lot of stuff we're gonna cover. I'll go through uh, some of it fairly quickly. I, I do have my digits and, and contact information on my last slide. So if anyone has follow-up questions, I know we'll have some Q&A time here during the uh, sessions themselves. Uh, we'll also have uh, the opportunity to, uh, um, I think, post some of this online. It's gonna be recorded, but, but you know, please don't hesitate to text or email or, or call if there's some follow-up things you wanna discuss because, uh, well, there's, there's a lot to talk about in these markets and, and so some of it will go through fairly quickly. The other thing I guess I'll maybe just mention as well a little bit is, is there sort of walk through in some ways just, just by nature of the calendar, you know, where we're kind of, we're sort of in the middle of old crop from a calendar perspective and yet from a marketing perspective, I think we're going to be a lot further than that. In fact, I suspect, you know, most in the audience, it's going to vary obviously from one farm to the next, but uh, most in the audience are either going to be, you know, fairly well sold on old crop or, or maybe don't have that much left already thinking ahead towards new crops. So as we walk through some of these slides, I guess, I guess the context of, of the discussion will be kind of, you know, kind of what happened, but but more so on of how that sets up, you know, why prices are where they're at today, and then maybe what that means here going forward. So um, with that, why don't we get into it? So, so we talk about peace here, uh, maybe, uh, you know, just sort of a few points, and I'm gonna walk through a, a bunch of slides that, that kind of outline this, but, but kind of some of the, the key points in terms of, of kind of where we're going. Uh, higher supply last year, you know, we did have a bigger crop in, in 2020, not enormously larger, but it was a bit bigger, but demand is, is, is growing even faster. And so that's where we're seeing a real drawdown in supplies, even though there was more supply available. So it was kind of a big supply, but even bigger demand scenario. China, it, it's all about China with the exports, uh, hugely dependent on that market. That's been great because they've been taking huge volumes. It's obviously supported prices, but you know there's some vulnerabilities with that. Domestic usage is up, and we know that's sort of been a trend that's sort of been getting some traction and growing, uh, and certainly that kind of helps underpin the whole complex. Uh, two different stories with yellows versus greens. You know, we sort of lump peas together, but but they are two different markets in many ways. So we'll we'll sort of pull that apart a little bit, and then we'll just talk a little bit about some of the risk and, and opportunity uh, ahead. So here's a graph of uh, Canadian pea seeded area. And uh, as you can see, you know, we, actually the seeded area was down a touch in 2020, uh, but that was kind of more than offset by, by a bump in yield. Uh, we do look for uh, an increase in acres overall this coming year, but up by about four, just over 4%. And so again, as we think about last year, it's not that, that you know, we kind of had the small crop. That's not what's driving prices. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, the yield was up a little bit. And so we actually had a larger crop on slightly lower acres. We are looking for a, a bit of an increase in acres here as we go ahead into 2021, 20, 22. However, as we know, it's uh, uh, that varied by type. And so if we look specifically, this is a graph of, of P acreage by type. And so as you can see, you know, last season, actually we had a, we had a dip in acres for, uh, for yellow, uh, peas, uh, whereas green pea acres were up. And so that's kind of caused this, because so much of this export demand initially has been focused on yellow peas, 
that's caused those supplies in particular to really, really get drawn down. Uh, green pea uh, production was up, actually got a little oversupplied, relatively speaking, because of the larger production. And so out of that, we sort of have that, uh, that price relationship, and we'll get into that a little bit in, in the, uh, shortly. <clears throat> but, you know, just kind of a reflection of, of the breakdown by type. We do see as we go forward here in this next season, we're going to actually see this bump in acres is going to actually not just be, you know, all yellows, but but more than all yellows because we're going to see uh, see green pea acres down a little bit. But but again, just a reflection of, of you know, not 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 the same story when we talk about peas, uh, when we look at the difference between yellows and uh, and greens. <clears throat> You know, what this chart shows, and so I guess one of the things I just want to illustrate, you know, you look at, for example, new crop prices of, of yellow peas, and you might wonder, well, geez, you know, why, you know, maybe we would expect a much larger increase in seeded area than uh, than, than 4%. <clears throat> and so what this graph actually shows is one of the things that, that we do, we do it a couple times over the course of the winter, is we break down a, a gross margin estimate by crop. Now, <clears throat> Maybe just just to give a bit of background on these numbers, I mean, what we do is we sort of take let's you know kind of an average yield. Uh, we take what new crop prices are available at the times we run the math. Sometimes if new crop prices aren't available yet, we'll maybe kind of plug in what we think they might come out at. And out of that, then we use costs based on SAS ag averages, and we come up with sort of a, a gross margin comparison. And rather than the specific numbers themselves, obviously that varies by farm, and there's all kinds of assumptions built in just gives us kind of just a real rough approximation about where crops might rank on a relative basis and so in this particular case in the dark brown soil zone and again depending what assumptions you want to plug in but it actually shows you know peas kind of let's call it the middle-ish of of the pack in this particular region and just want to highlight here is is and I think it's something of course we all know but you know pea prices are really high for new crop old crop in particular, but also for new crop, but but everything else is going up as well, right? And when it comes to acres and seeded area and, and the market kind of trying to battle for acres, it really is on a, on a relative basis. And by the way, these numbers were run, well, probably a few weeks ago. Of course, these markets are very dynamic. Uh, something like canola, for example, has been aggressively higher since these numbers were run, so that might rejig some of the rankings. But again, just a bit of an illustration that as much as peat prices have been really strong, uh, so was everything else. <clears throat> this is a similar graph for the black soil zone. Here, peas rank relatively better. They're, they're close to the top. Uh, but again, you know, look at flax, you look at canola, you look at some other markets that, uh, some crops that are that are not that far behind it. And so again, just, just to kind of illustrate that point that as much as, as new crop prices have been strong for peas, uh, it's not necessarily buying in a whole lot more acres. Some, but not a whole lot more. And again, just that reflection of the broader broader market environment that we're, that we're in. <clears throat> this is a graph of, uh, of pea supplies by type, and, and again, you can see that uh, uh, last season, um, a bump in supplies because of the higher yields, more so in the greens than in the yellows, a little bit more in the yellows, and so we expect this coming year, again, big assumptions around yield, and maybe I'll just take a moment to pause now. One of the things that we do when we think, when we try and forecast production, we kind of assume an average-ish or a trend-type yield we're certainly well aware that that there's a lot of dryness across uh, across the prairies here and and so you know to say that weather is a big question mark is is you know kind of a you know overstating the obvious that's always the case but but certainly you know we're you know we are watching how dry it is through a good portion of the prairies and 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 of course that'll be a big factor a big factor particularly when we look at how tight supplies are not just for peas but for almost all crops. And so uh, that's something we'll, we'll, we're, we're monitoring here real closely, but it could very well be a situation where even though acres are up, we might see almost no supply growth uh, if yields back off a little bit. Again, obviously weather dictates that. And you know, again, we could have great weather and, and yields are up and, and then maybe we get a bigger bump in supplies. But certainly because, because of how things tight are uh, in these markets, you know, it's, it's really, really is uh, you know, extremely sensitive to, uh, to, to weather. So this is a graph of December 31st stocks uh, based on, on StatsCan estimate. And, and I guess just what I wanted to illustrate here is that even though we actually had uh, supplies up, stocks as of December 31st based on StatsCan were, were lower. And so uh, there was a bigger supply. And yet by the time we clicked over to the new calendar year, we actually had a smaller, we had a smaller supply. And basically, what does that reflect? Basically, it's a reflection of just, of just the enormous demand early on in the season. Okay, so 
uh, what we're seeing here actually, and, and we'll walk through this in a little bit more detail, huge export demand through the first part of the year. Also domestic demand is up quite a bit as well, domestic usage, okay? So, so both parts of that demand story were up significantly from last year. So, so again, supply is bigger, but we're using way more of it, using it at an unsustainable pace, and, and hence that's what's gonna that's what's gonna drive that uh, drive the market and the prices that we've been seeing. So this is a graph in terms of our forecast and expectations through the through the year, and and again just uh, just the idea that with the exception of 16, 17, when we think exports, you know, I don't we don't know, well, basically the supplies aren't available to be able to catch, fully catch up exports and usage to what we had in 16, 17, but essentially we're we're going to be pushing record record demand here so again it's not that it's not a supply heavy or it's not a supply shortage story per se it's that demand pull which really is really is uh, you know makes for for a healthier market and and strong prices and and again we've been we've been seeing that this is a graph of p exports by type uh, by a month and and again dominated by yellows and just just an enormous month in September. You know, we I mean, exported over 750,000 tons in September. So just just an absolutely enormous month. And uh, that early season pace, again, second fastest on record, um, going through a normal seasonal slowdown, which, which uh, you know, is, is, of course, obviously no surprise. Uh, but uh, as we look ahead here, uh, about 130,000 tons, uh, sorry, um, running ahead of the pace needed to kind of make uh, to sort of hit our target for the year and uh, again we think that based on some of the data we see here going forward we shouldn't have any trouble hitting that and again which is, is ultimately going to draw our, our market down to very to really tight levels uh, ultimately we need to slow down the pace of demand from what we've been what we've been seeing so far Here's a graph of weekly uh, CGC exports kind of on a cumulative basis going forward. And so, you know, so the StatsCan data was just kind of to the end of, uh, to the end of December. And uh, what we have here is you know, more of a weekly update. And again, just, just a reflection that, you know, those, those exports have continued on at a steady pace. Now the, the CGC data doesn't include containers. So we sort of wait for the StatsCan data to kind of, you know, sort of capture the full story. Uh, but it does give us a bit of a barometer along the way, and, and again, just a reflection of the fact that exports have been moving along actually at a at a pretty good pace. So we're not really seeing much of a slowdown yet. So at this stage of the game, as much as at some point we're going to need to slow, see a slowdown in volumes, we're not really seeing that yet. So far, that movement has been has been very good. This is a graph of of uh, visible supplies from uh, from the CGC. And so it's both a combination of the primary elevator, but then also at terminals. And so kind of what we've been seeing here is a little bit of a buildup supplies in recent weeks. And so what does that tell us? Basically, it tells us that that uh, commercials and exporters are kind of accumulating some inventory in anticipation of further further exports. And either it's business that's already been done or, or maybe expectation of business that will be done. But again, just kind of one more sign that we're watching. So So ultimately, what does that mean? It's a market. We need to kind of slow down demand. We need to slow down exports because ultimately supplies are kind of running down. And yet so far that's not the case. So again, just one more sign, you know, the weekly exports are, are, are steady and solid and also exporters continue to accumulate supplies, which indicates that we are gonna to continue to see more weeks of, of strong export demand here ahead. So that's uh, that's just uh, just kind of what we're reflecting here. And, and again, just a sign that that the market still is not is not doing uh, enough, if you will, to kind of slow down, slow down demand, even at these, at these high prices. So this is a graph and this is kind of both uh, kind of, you know, historical, but maybe more important, what we expect for the full season and the current season and looking ahead. This is Canadian P exports by destination. And, you know, maybe just to kind of highlight in particular that, that red part of those bars in the middle, that's China. OK, and so we've talked about, uh, you know, we heard in the introduction of the meeting, we talked about how just just how dominant China is as an importer. And this kind of visually just shows just this enormous chunk of our exports that are that are going to China. And so that's uh, that's great when it's going well. Also creates some vulnerabilities. We'll talk a little bit about that here as we get into some slides, but just to kind of visually get a sense just of, of just this huge footprint that China has in terms of, of P exports and how that's been such a driver of the market. Also of note, and we'll also touch on this as well, sort of the sort of the, the teal color lines in, in the bottom half, you can just see that's India. 
basically dropped down almost essentially zero, right? Or not zero, but certainly very, very low volumes. We don't expect that to change. Again, we'll touch on that, but but just sort of how that baton has been handed kind of from being India dominant to where it's now, you know, so so heavily on, on China. This is a graph of China imports from from all destinations. Of course, you know that's uh, you know Canada is, is the is the largest supplier, but but just you know essentially 50% higher than than their previous uh, largest year for the calendar year to the end of December, just shy of three million tons. So just just a huge increase in their imports. So they had been sort of walking higher over the course of the, of a couple of years, 2018 and 2019 were a big leap from 2017. And now just making a full leg higher again. So just uh, just an enormous demand from China. This is both you know fractionation, but also there's definitely a feed component to that. As China as price of soybean meal and other feed uh, uh, feedstuffs and feed uh, grains and so forth, they've been sucking in <laughs> huge huge supplies of essentially everything. And there's an element of that that's helping drive that that pea market as well. This is a graph of pea imports from China to into China, and and it shows actually by destination. And, and basically, just what I wanted to illustrate in this slide is is just the absolute vast, overwhelming majority of these peas are coming from Canada at this point. And so, uh, you know, again, it's it's uh, it's been great as long as things are going well. Uh, and sorry, this slide uh, not fully updated, and so I can apologize for that. Uh, but it's a reflection just how dominant Canada has been as a, as a supplier for pea imports. And again, that's great when things are going well, but it does create some vulnerabilities. Uh, we, we've seen, for example, with, uh, you know, with, with canola, when China you know, reduces their purchases significantly for, you know, for political reasons. And you know, that can cause a big disruption in the market when they're a major customer. Also, the potential for Ukraine to potentially become more of a, a supplier of China as they kind of work out some of their phy phytosanitary restrictions and so forth. Uh, there's a meal replacement component that's going into China. So we don't expect by any means for China to just suddenly go away. But I also think as, as we look ahead and we think about, okay, where are some of the risks, where are some of the vulnerabilities potentially? And, and I think we'd be remiss to... Uh, at least not be aware or have our antenna up a little bit about okay where might there potentially be some cracks when one when market is 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 become such a huge part of our demand base and so that's just something that we continue to watch here going forward. In the interim, this is a graph of, of peak prices in China and and prices continue to move higher. Okay, so as long as prices continue to move higher in China, that's going to help draw whatever they can out of Canada. So we expect that we will continue to see volumes there uh, uh, <clears throat> moving strongly again as their own domestic prices move up. Certainly, they're not having an incentive yet to, to buy fewer peas from, from Canada. We are watching soy meal prices in China closely. They have come off a little bit. But still remain at very high levels. <clears throat> so that is that is one area I think, again that we watch or within this whole process as we think about particularly at current prices. <clears throat> always sort of weighing that uh, you know that demand and and uh, supply and kind of uh, the risk reward balance. And so you know again we watch for potential cracks in the armor. So far not seeing any major vulnerabilities, but also careful not to be complacent. <clears throat> so this is a graph of Indian uh, P imports cumulative essentially next to nothing, okay? And so uh, they've essentially been importing almost zero peas from, from anyone, not just Canada. And so this is, uh, again, just a reflection of that, that big demand shift over the course of a few years where India was kind of the dominant, most important market, and, and now they're, they're hardly more than an afterthought in, in many ways. And so, you know, visually it's, it's uh, uh, just, just a reflection of how, uh, how that has changed just, just dramatically. Just a quick comment on Indian weather, and, and Marlena may get into that a little bit more so as uh, as she uh, speaks into some of the other crops here. But just want to touch briefly on on India and particularly about peas. Generally speaking, it seems like like uh, pulse conditions, crop conditions are are kind of let's call it average in most of the country. There's some variable reports. India is a big country; it's not going to be the same in all regions. But generally speaking, let's call it average-ish in terms of of conditions. Uh, P area is is up, 11% uh, ahead of last year, uh, running in, you know just ahead of the five-year average, and ultimately, what does that suggest? Likely not a loosening of P import restrictions. So unless there's a real shortfall in production, unless there's a real shortfall in yields, unless there's something that significantly changes, 
ultimately we don't think that India is going to come back in a significant way as an importer for peas. And so that's kind of our assumption going forward. Again, puts that emphasis back on China and the importance of that market. Just want to uh, also just, just talk a little bit here, uh, and we're going to look at some other international numbers here, but just wanted to pause a little bit talking about domestic usage. And so this is again from that December 31st Statistics Canada uh, uh, supply and demand and, and uh, stocks information that they, they put out in early February. And just, you know, finally seeing that bump in domestic use that we've sort of been, been waiting to have show up. Now, I say that with a little bit of caution because there's a couple parts of this domestic use story. One is because it's, you know, just the nature of, of its line in the balance sheet. Sometimes it's used as, let's call it a bit of a fudge factor to make the numbers work. So I always take that number with, with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we are starting to see some plants coming online. Again, the feed market also maybe has been drawing some in, uh, given how high the prices of feed grains and, and meal prices and so forth. But, you know, finally, we're kind of seeing that that big bump in in, uh, in domestic use, at least as, as StatsCan starts to capture some of the data. <clears throat> so this is our graph for, uh, for domestic use, our expectation for all of 2021. And we think we're going to see uh, that number increase again going into, into next season. A couple more plants coming online here, sort of full bore. And, and again, I, I think we believe that this is a trend that's going to just continue to walk higher. And so that's really, uh, you know, a, a great story. As we think about some of the vulnerabilities potentially of, of a market like China, uh, the ability of for us to consume, process more domestically and in, in high use, high value markets, that's a great story. That's a great trend. And uh, look forward to that continuing to grow. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's just, just great for growers, healthy. And so something we uh, something we look look forward to, and uh, and so that's 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 a good story, a trend that that continues to have some legs. <clears throat> as we talk about the market a little bit further here as well, just talking about pea deliveries as a percentage of on-farm supply, and and just just a reflection here. So so what this uh, <clears throat> what the uh, the yellow bars are, are weekly deliveries. Of course, you see the big glut and harvest, and then things kind of taper off. But again, we're seeing over the last number of weeks here, the last couple months strong deliveries into the system and maybe more importantly the the lines across the graph reflect the percentage of the pea supply that has been delivered okay and so you can see the five-year average would be at this time of year call it just over 50 percent and at this stage of the game we're looking at about 60 percent of the pea supply that has already been delivered into the system so that's physically moved into the system okay so that's running ahead of last year it's running well ahead of the five-year average and the other part of that is when you think about the number of peas on farm that have maybe already been sold and have been committed, so are not really available to the market, I mean, maybe that's another 10, 15, possibly 20%. And so you could look here potentially as maybe a quarter of the pea supply that's not already spoken for. So again, just a reflection of, of just how tight that pea supply is and, and commercials just in a position that if they want to get coverage, they're going to have to work harder for it. There's not many peas left that are unspoken for, not a lot of supply left on farm, in increasingly strong hands. Uh, the prices of other crops have been very, very good. So farmers generally speaking are in a good cash position. They can be patient if they want to. And so this is again, just kind of one more barometer of just how tight this pea market is here for, for old crop and why, it, you know, barring some type of a shock or, or, you know, Chinese demand hitting a wall, which I don't think is going to happen or something like that, you know, this market's going to stay very robust. So this is our expectation for P ending stocks. Uh, and, you know, here again, you know, we see very tight in, in the current year, essentially kind of drawn down to, let's call it, you know, pipeline-ish levels. And even with a bump in, in acres next year, Again, yields have, are a big part of that story, but we really don't see any any rebuilding of supplies here next year. It'll take something fairly significant or dramatic on the demand side, or just an absolutely monster yield with that we grow here in Western Canada to to see any kind of rebuilding of stocks. Okay, so just a, just a, again a reflection of just how tight this market is, and we don't see it necessarily just getting solved immediately either. So I mentioned early on again, and we touched on a little bit the, the difference in, in between the greens and the yellows. And so this is just a graph of North American green pea production. And again, just sort of telling the two different tales, if you will, between yellow and green peas. This is a combination of both Canada and the US. And so we can see in this last season how Canada saw a big bump in green pea uh, production. 
the U.S. also saw an increase in green pea production. And even though demand has been good on a relative basis, it's a market that was much more heavily supplied than yellows. And so, again, it's no surprise that many green pea prices have been, been lagging, actually now trading at a, at a discount to yellows. And again, it's just a reflection of, of relative supply growth between the two. One saw our supply growth, the other one uh, didn't grow and, and the relative demand early in the season. And so that's kind of, you know, explaining what's been going on in relative prices. But uh, but this is kind of just just to illustrate again, just just what's been happening in greens relative to to yellows or, or just peas in, in general from a North American perspective. So this is our expectations for, for ending stocks by, by the two classes. And, and maybe in a particular note is, as we look at 2021, we actually could see ending stocks of, of greens being higher than yellows. So yellows just drawn down to absolute, you know, bare bones pipeline levels. And actually we could end up with more green peas on farm than, uh, than yellow peas at the end of the current year. So again, just a reflection of those two different markets. We do think, looking ahead into next year, that that will get a little bit more aligned to a somewhat more normal level. Not that we're going to see a, a, a build in pea stocks per se, but with smaller acres and greens, maybe that supply gets run down and, and sort of bring those markets a little bit more in line from a relative perspective. And so, you know, that's that's kind of kind of what we anticipate when we look at ending stocks by the two different classes. Just taking a, a look globally a little bit. And so this is a graph of just kind of major exporters. So we saw a bit of a bump in production in Canada. Australia saw a pretty good increase in, in their crop as well, uh, but ultimately uh, not a big increase in production for from the major from the major uh, uh, exporters globally. And so, you know, globally, it's also a reasonably tight situation. Again, of, of the non-Canadian exporters, Australia is, is the one uh, one exception. Huge increase in production in there after a couple of real short crops. Uh, this crop might actually end up being a little higher than what was uh, officially stated by A Bears in their last report. They have a tendency to kind of underreport their pulse crops, but uh, but ultimately big increase in production. Australia doesn't export a huge portion of their pea crop. It's not like you know 90% of their pea crop gets exported or anything like that. So it's not like this increase in production is going to kind of flood global markets. So certainly there's more exportable supplies out of Australia than we saw previously, but it's not like there's going to be this this massive wave of Australian peas coming into the market. So you know it's it's uh, it's not as bearish per se as you might think when looking at a big rebound in production from what is otherwise a, a key a key exporter. This is a graph of, of field pea production out of the Black Sea. And so again, last year in 2020, it was actually lower than the previous year. We are looking for a rebound in production in this coming year, okay? So when we look ahead to maybe what some of the potential vulnerabilities are from a new crop perspective, a bigger crop in, in uh, both Ukraine and Russia, now, if Ukraine also gets, uh, gets a bit of a, uh, gets some better access to the, to the Chinese market, potentially displaces some Canadian supplies or adds a bit of adds a bit of competition. Again, the volumes aren't huge, so it's not like we're going to just suddenly be shut out. But, you know, potentially a little bit more of a threat or a little bit of a risk and something that we're just going to have our antenna on. And so, uh, again, you know, weather is a big factor in all those things, but just, just something to be watchful of and, and thoughtful of. The one thing as well with some of these black sea crops, they do come to market ahead of ahead of us, so they get harvested a bit early. And so, you know, maybe it's something where we're a little cautious about maybe early movement potentially and those sorts of things if it looks like their production is uh, is in, in in good shape. Again, access to that Chinese market will be be a key part though for, for Ukrainian volumes. So this is the actual S&D and there's a whole bunch of numbers on the screen and I'm not necessarily gonna, gonna break down in, in a whole lot of detail here, uh, but just kind of numerically sort of showing some of the things that we we walked through with, with our previous slides. Uh, again, looking in aggregate for just a bit of a bump in seeded area. Yield is a big question mark. As I mentioned earlier, we're sort of plugging kind of a trend five-year average type yield. So maybe down a bit from last year. Again, who knows what that ultimately looks like. If that is the case, in aggregate, we're only looking really at about flat production, even though, uh, even though the acres are going to be up, which means that there's no growth in total supply. Ultimately, what does that mean? It means that we can't really export any more than, uh, than we did this past year, even if the market demands it, particularly if our domestic consumption goes up, which is, is what we expect as new plants come online. So again, in aggregate, uh, looks like it's gonna be a very, very tight market here going forward. This is a graph of specifically for yellows. And again, just uh, you know, most of the, not just most, all the increase and then some of those acres are gonna, gonna go into yellow peas. 
Again, it's a uh, uh, question mark about, about yield, but we'll see some bump in production, some bump in supplies, but because that market is so tight coming in and demand ex should ex continue to be very robust, it's just gonna be another very, very tight ye a market for, for yellows. Uh, whereas greens, again, with the green specifically, maybe a bit of a bit of a drop in area here again and that's ultimately what the market is signaling to growers is to plant fewer greens that'll help maybe bring that market back into a little bit of a better balance and so we see some you know some tightening of that that green market just as we grow less and there's less supply just a couple quick comments on some prices here uh, so this is a graph of, of yellow prices of peas and green peas in canada and the u.s Again, everything is moving higher, which is no surprise. Yellow outpacing greens, which we know and which you guys see at the farm level, greens have been moving higher, sort of getting dragged up in some ways with some of the other residual markets, such as you know the feed markets and so forth, which are maybe less particular about, about yellows and, and greens. This is a graph of the green minus yellow pea bid, and ultimately it shows greens trading at a discount. Again, something that you uh, guys are familiar with and maybe see at the farm level, but just uh, kind of something that uh, you know, kind of shows up visually here. This is a graph of, of a 10 year yellow pea bid and just just showing how you know again from a historical perspective how strong those those pea prices are and again something that maybe you all know but just visually and graphically just something to kind of uh, kind of take a look at that and and, and just see what a uh, just the lofty levels that we're at. What I just wanted to illustrate in this is, is just kind of the, in the circle there, just a graph of some of those new crop prices moving up here as well a little bit. And again, you guys know that, you guys see that, but but uh, seeing some, some new crop movement as well. And again, as we mentioned early on, it's not like it's necessarily buying in a whole lot of acres uh, just because of the, uh, the competition from other crops. So just a few closing comments on the piece specifically. Again, robust export will continue. Definitely there's a, a meal feed wave that's helping. A new crop balance sheet continues to look tight, but uh, you know there are some risks and that we're going to be uh, just just watchful of and careful of, and, and particularly the reliance on China, some global competition, and and the extent to which that the meal and, and feed markets are supporting uh, supporting the pea complex. Shifting to chickpeas, and so in this particular case, you know chickpea market definitely a different story. Still working through an oversupply. Not seeing the same surge in export demand, which we'll see, you know, bids kind of more up as a bit of a passenger, maybe more a reflection of slow farmer selling. And, and so this is a market that continues to have rebalancing taking place through the rest next growing season. Okay, so this is a graph of our of, of chickpea seeded area and yield. Our expectation, a sizable drop in acres again in, in this coming season. Ultimately, again, the combination of disease issues and the market just not really uh uh, calling for for more acres and, and farmers who think are going to respond. So so big drop in the last couple of years hasn't stopped the market from being oversupplied and and we believe that prairie farmers are going to reflect that with plantings here this spring. So this is a graph of total supply. So we've actually been seeing supply grow even though acres have been coming down these last couple of years. Okay, and so that's ultimately you know farmers have sort of been trying to do their part by reducing acres and yet that hasn't stopped supply from. From, from increasing a combination of big carry-ins uh, and, and uh, all offsetting, more than offsetting the drop in production. Okay, so this is the graph of December 31st stocks of chickpeas. And again, just kind of reflects a, a similar story to what we saw previously. There's some question as to whether StatsCan actually is overstating chickpea stocks. Is that actually, you know, the stocks that they're reporting on farm and, and that's maybe debatable. Nonetheless, I think certainly the market is telling us and suggesting that stocks are large and whether the StatsCan number is, is the right number or whether this is uh, uh, overstated, nonetheless, you know, certainly the market is telling us that there's an abundance of supply, regardless of what the actual number is. This is one of the, 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 the parts that have been a challenge with chickpeas is just the fact that, that exports have been sluggish. So we got this, you know, the large supply, large crop, large carry in, the demand has not been there. And that's uh, monthly, we're running behind last year, we're running behind average, we're running behind the pace that we, we need to hit what we think is gonna be our targets for the year. I think we'll see those numbers bump up as we go forward, but we are at the risk of, of running short of what already is, is not a very robust export forecast. This is our expectation for ending stocks. So again, big build again this year as, as that demand is sluggish, big carry over from the previous year. We think that there will be the process of some rebalancing this next year, again, big drop in production, but that market still has some work to do. So this is a graph of average Canadian chickpea bids and you know a bit of an uptick here again is you know largely uh, 
you know, largely a, a reflection probably of slow farmer selling and, and, you know, trying to maybe a little bit of trying to cope some out of that bins, but ultimately it's been relatively flat and pretty lackluster when you look at not just most other pulse markets, but pretty much all crop markets in, in general. Again, just sort of that 10-year perspective and, and just a, just a lackluster story for, for chickpeas. And, and again, just ultimately the market just reflecting that, that large supply, sluggish demand, and you know, trying to send that signal to, to, to you guys as farmers to plant less of it this next year. This is a graph of chickpea production across uh, some of the, the more significant countries globally. And we have seen that number coming down, but again, just sort of working through that massive, massive overhang in 2018, one of the challenges with markets in general that are oversupplied is, is that it just takes time to work stocks lower. So that is something that we are, you know, will continue to work through that process, not just in Canada, but globally. And so that number has come down quite a bit in 2020, again, from, from some of these key countries, but it's still an ongoing, ongoing work in progress. So it wasn't just Canada, it was, was other countries as well. There's a graph of US chickpea ending stocks, kind of going through the same process that we've been going through. Large supply, large supply overhang, and ultimately a market that needs to try and, and reduce production and reduce acres to get back into balance. Russia has been working its way lower a little bit. It was a little smaller this past year. So they've sort of started through that process. Again, not particularly tight, uh, but their production is down a little bit. That helps particularly more so with a smaller caliber chickpeas. Um, India is exporting more that maybe weighs in the market here in the interim a little bit. But one of the things that, that it is helping to do is helping to draw down their supplies. And so this is a graph of what the expectation is for Indian uh, Kabuli ending stocks. And that we think that maybe after a couple of years of, of massive overhang, their stocks should finally start get drawn down. So again, that process of the market globally trying to, trying to bring itself into some rebalance. One of the things, one of the risks we see going forward is that Mexican area looks like it's going to see a sizable rebound. So not anywhere close to what 2018 is, again, just a part of that contribution to that massive global overhang. But nonetheless, we see a rebound there. So that is a bit of a risk that we're, that we're, we're watchful for. So here's, uh, here's our S&D. And again, I won't, uh, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to belabor walking through all the individual numbers. But again, just, uh, just anticipating a fairly sizable reduction in, in acres. Uh, the crop size should come down a fair bit. That large carryover means we won't see as big a drop in supply as we'd like. Uh, ultimately, we could see a bit of a bump in, in exports, and that'll maybe help draw that, uh, that carryout lower. But again, it's just an ongoing process of, of the market doing its rebalancing. So just a couple quick comments on chickpeas. Again, the market still has work to do. Uh, lagging prices means that... Uh, you know, maybe that heavier balance sheet isn't necessarily bearish per se from current levels in, in the context of the rest of this, the, uh, the uh, pulse complex moving so much higher, you know, it's definitely been lagging. So relatively speaking, it's become quite cheap, but uh, you know, certainly it's, it's not necessarily bullish unless you run into some major weather problems. And so in that context, we may be viewed as more, more balanced for the, for the coming season. Again, as much as anything, it's it's a reflection of slow farmer selling and the lackluster prices and and uh, and a market that's just lagging the rest of the complex. So just quickly walk through a few comments on on faba beans. So production is up. Uh, we are seeing more export competition. Uh, the market has largely been maybe feed driven more so in the shorter term. We think there's opportunity for growth in the most in domestic processing and in export markets, but that's more of an ongoing longer term story with with faba beans as as we see it. So this is a graph of seeded area. And so for 2021, we do see a little bit of a pullback in seeded area, not dramatic. Ultimately, acres are kind of staying rough, stay roughly in a range. And we think that's probably going to be the case again, excuse me, this coming year. So maybe the lowest in three years, but not a huge drop off and, you know, kind of ballpark within the range of what we've been seeing the last, last couple of seasons. Again, production, big part of that is, is yield, but, you know, down from last year was what we expect. Uh, but kind of in the range of what we've seen within the last number of years. And so again, relatively relatively steady, but maybe squeezed a little bit due to some other other pulses as the market maybe has, has, has lagged a little bit. Exports have been a bit sluggish. Okay, so we've definitely been seeing exports kind of running behind the last uh, last couple seasons, the last few years. They've been picking up a little bit. One of the things we have seen is, is exports now moving to a couple other markets other than Egypt and the US. And so that's an encouraging and a positive sign. But ultimately, uh, we think exports will probably continue to lag here through the balance of the year. And that's just a little bit of a headwind to, to what the upside is to, uh, to the outlook here going forward for FABAs. 
Why are exports lagging? Well, a great big part of that is the fact that Australia had a huge rebound in production. So unlike peas where maybe not, you know, peas, they're a key exporter when they have a large crop, but it's not like the bulk of their peas necessarily get exported. That's not so much the case with FABAs. They're an aggressive exporter in the FABA bean market. And so as we see this huge rebound in production, a record large crop, again, potentially even understated a little bit, uh, that's ultimately, you know, creates a lot of competition in export markets and that kind of eats into some of our opportunity. And, and that's kind of why our own export volume has been lagging compared to the previous couple of years when you can see how, how drought just decimated their own, their own fab of bean production. And so this is a graph of, of monthly exports out of, out of Australia. And, and again, just, just blowing the doors off in terms of volumes. And ultimately, you know, that, that crimps what our opportunity is. And so they got a big supply that they continue to work through. This is a graph of faba bean production in Europe, up a little bit this past season, not a huge uh, increase in production. Again, you know, well below maybe what it was sort of 2015 to 2017, but you know, kind of relatively steady and up a little bit and uh, potentially again this next season. So not necessarily much of a story here, but certainly not getting supply help per se, you know, with a smaller crop in this region either. So just a bit of a graph of some, some prices here. And so this is a graph, the blue line is yellow peas. And we can see, of course, as we know how much that market has taken off. But, but it may, just as much as anything wanted to draw attention. So the green line is the, the faba bean price. The yellow line is the feed pea price. And, and just sort of that, that, that idea that we are seeing a little bit of help from that feed complex and that feed market. Uh, now faba beans, maybe not as established in, in feed rations, not all varieties are suitable for feed markets but there is an element of, of sort of getting pulled up from below from the feed market and that certainly is is sort of helping drive the market recently so that's been a that's been a supportive factor this is a graph of, of uh, faba prices globally and so one of the things in spite of the fact that that europe was up a little bit massive increase in the australian crop uh, our own crop last year was was up a bit faba prices you know, certainly not the kind of uh, robust chart we're seeing with peas or some other crops, but they do kind of continue to kind of walk their way higher here a little bit. So they are holding reasonably firm. Again, that feed component and just sort of everything else sort of underneath it is, or everything above it is sort of almost sort of pulling it higher. That's been a supportive, helpful factor. But, uh, you know, it's it's a market that maybe doesn't necessarily have the same story uh, as, you know, peas or, or, you know, lentils or some of the other crops that have been been really robust. So maybe just uh, just a couple broader comments I wanted to make just in, in general here, just kind of kind of wrapping up a little bit uh, on on my portion here. You know, there's a few things that have affected pulse markets in particular, uh, all crop markets that we just just you know need to be a little cognizant of as we go forward here. One, you know, certainly COVID has had a positive effect, well, particularly in pulse markets, uh, but in some other crops and some other markets as well. And I think it'll be just interesting to see the extent to how some of this plays out going forward. There's no doubt that. Uh, you know that that the the, the plant-based diet and some of those longer-term structural components are helping pulse prices and pulse demand longer term, but there's definitely sort of a COVID component where there was some demand getting pulled ahead by countries as they try and make sure their inventories are well stocked. Uh, there's an element of just even consumers buying more pulses, the, how they store, and all those sorts of things. And as some of that normalizes, is some of that maybe pop and demand going to lag a little bit? Is there some future demand that was pulled ahead? I'm not sure. Something to be watchful of. Uh, logistical impacts, you know, talking about, we've heard lots about, you know, containers being in tight supply, shipping costs going up. How is some of that going to play out? And I think there too, you know, it's one that could have a bit of an impact on markets. And, and I think it's uncertain, but something that we've got to be watchful of. Watchful of macroeconomic uncertainty. You know, uh, foreign exchange markets, we've seen some strength in the Canadian dollar. Uh, there's talk about whether wider commodity market sentiment, is money gonna flow into commodity markets? Does that you know, push up the Canadian dollar? Does that push up the value of, of all commodities in general in sympathy? Also a lot of economic uncertainty with massive government debts and so forth. In some ways, kind of what happens maybe in London or on Wall Street and so forth might seem a long way from what your local P bids are but there is ultimately risk and potential spillover effects that could play into that. And it's also something we just need to be mindful of and, and watchful of. Also geopolitical tensions. And, and that's something that is a risk. And we talked a little bit about that specifically with China, but the truth is we are in, a, in an environment where just in general, trade is more easily disrupted than it has been in the past. There's been a shift in sentiment from global trade in general, 
uh, as much as as maybe Biden is, uh, you know, the Biden administration, maybe he's a little more, uh, let's call it mainstream and, and, you know, maybe polite on Twitter, if you will, for lack of a better term, doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be more of an open trade type of individual. I think some indications in terms of, of uh, you know, how they're responding to China and so forth means some of that might not change. And, and all that is just reflective of an environment that's less open to trade than it had been maybe five, six years ago. And I think that that's just a risk that we have to learn to live with in all ag markets and not necessarily that pulses get targeted per se. It's just a reality, I think, of all crop markets in general. So, you know, something that we need to just be mindful of and watchful of. So just a few final concluding thoughts. You know, in the shorter term, momentum, I think, is higher. And we think particularly about peas, but that helps sort of drag other pulse markets and crop markets in general, just in terms of, of momentum is higher, stocks are tight. Demand support on multiple fronts, again, for peas in particular, but for pulses in general. And so all of that is, is, is just supportive for the market overall. Longer term, um, maybe less of an acreage and production increase than you might think in other high, compared to other high priced years because so many other crops and markets are also high priced you know, going forward. That's helping limit acreage growth. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, certainly there's an incentive for farmers globally to plant more pulses. And so we could see some additional production come online in the U.S., in the Black Sea region and some others. Longer term underlying pulse demand trends are favorable. Again, we just want to be cognizant of some of the demand risks, not that they're necessarily structural risks per se, but we are getting support from the feed complex. Uh, maybe other markets, other, other exporters working their way into China. And so these are things we just want to be mindful of even though the broader environment looks supportive again this, this coming season from an overall market price perspective. So with that, uh, that's, that's kind of all I have prepared for, uh, for slides. Again, I, I, you know, I, I know we have some time for questions at the end of the presentation here, and I know that some of this is online, so folks have an opportunity to go back and look at some of the slides, but I, <clears throat> I do have my, my number and my email address on here, and so I certainly uh, welcome any questions or, or uh, anything that anyone wants to chat about after the fact here as, as well uh, uh, that maybe I didn't address or wasn't very clear. I know I walked through some of this stuff fairly quickly. So uh, um, with that, um, I appreciate your attention and, and the opportunity and, and uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll hand it over and, and welcome any questions uh, at, the, uh, at the tail end of the meeting. Great job, thanks Jonathan. Uh, it's nice to see you breaking down the, what we've got for current market situation. Uh, if you have questions, don't forget to type them in the question box in the, the GoToWebinar dashboard and we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the session. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Marlena Borsch. She's our next speaker. She's going to be sharing insights into the lentil, soybean, and dry bean markets. Marlena has been actively involved in the ag industry in Canada since 1983. She has a master's degree in ag economics and traded and exported Canadian commodities, including pulses, internationally for 20 years. She's worked for Cargill Grain, Excan Grain, and leading Birdex Canada. In 2003, Marlena co-founded Mercantile Consulting Venture, a professional services company specializing in private label market intelligence, risk market solutions, and project consulting. Good morning and welcome, Marlena. Yeah, good morning to everyone. Uh, certainly a pleasure to be here. So now that we're all set, uh, I'm certainly pleased to be here and uh, my privilege to talk about lentils, beans and soybeans. And we'll put the emphasis on lentils because I assume that most of the viewers uh, are lentil growers and there will be fewer that uh, grow dry beans and soybeans in Saskatchewan. So what a year we have had. Um, certainly uh, wonderful prices uh, on most commodities, including pulses. And uh, I think, you know, it beckons to us to make sure that we harvest those yields, um, those high prices, and, uh, you know, get good returns on the crops, especially I'm thinking of next year, where we are starting at a higher level than we had last year. Um, and, you know, in the end, it requires that we follow the demand and supply balance um, and monitor how it develops throughout the year. That's the only way to really do that. And, um, you know, this presentation is certainly part of that attempt to do so. So let's see, where's my, there we go. 
um, again, you know, this is uh, an outline of my presentation and uh, beginning with lentils and then beans uh, and, and stopping with soybeans. Um, on lentils, um, Canada is a leader in the market. So what our balance sheet, our supply and demand um, picture shows is very, very important uh, to the world, basically. You know, the buyers will be watching that as well as the other suppliers. On dry beans and soybeans, the situation is a little bit different because we are uh, from a global point of view, a very small supplier, and we basically uh, follow off that market. So the way we look at the numbers, you know, is a little bit different. Um, before we start um, on, on the individual commodities, I just wanted to review what's different this year. And, um, uh, you know, there are a number of factors that have really been driving us and uh, the demand for pulses this year certainly is unusually high um, versus a fairly stable supply. And uh, that's partially supported by the high feed numbers and Jonathan was talking about that, particularly with respect to, to peas. Um, but in Canada, we have an additional factor and, and um, I think we shouldn't tire to point that out. <clears throat> and one of these factors is the increased rail availability. Um, uh, we have a rail car supply that's unusually good. And um, uh, I'll show you one graph um, following this one, which shows you how it has helped our exports. And I think we should really endeavor to keep the situation similar in, in the years going forward. Um, uh, this year, coal and um, uh, fertilizer um, shipments, actually fertilizer shipments were up, but coal certainly was down and some of the other commodities and that freed up um, some of the capacities. And I think, you know, from a point of view of an agricultural industry, we really need to hang on to that. Prices for major crops are the multi-year high, as you know. Um, so that influences new crop um, through the bigger competition for 2021 acres. So, you know, that is bringing us some excellent pricing opportunities for the upcoming crop year. And just as a general observation, and I think John alluded to that in a way, is that we really have gone in a, in a number of commodities from a supply push market to a demand pull market, which behaves really quite differently. So, as I promised, you know, here's the slide on the on the effects, I should say, of the rail availability. And you can see here, um, I've uh, listed canola, peas, lentils, and all commodities. And you can see that grain shipments are very significantly up from last year. And I attribute that to some degree, not only to the demand, but also to our ability to move the stuff. So year to date, we have actually shipped 7.9 million tons more from the prairies uh, compared to the previous year. So um, just imagine how much more return that puts into your genes on the prairies and what, does it, what it does to the overall economy. And I think um, we need to advertise that more, how important the agricultural industry is uh, in general to us. Um, so with that, we move into the lentil data specifically. And um, uh, I wanted to reflect as I begin that really, and, and what do you need to make good decisions for lentils in the year going forward? Um, and first, uh, for the remaining crop that you have, for the 2020 crop, I know a lot has been shipped, there's certainly a little bit left. And, you know, here we have a lot of information already. We have a starting supply base that's fairly solid. We know the same about our competitors like Australia, um, uh, some of the Black Sea countries. We know the pace of usage and the exports here to date. Um, you know, we have stats can numbers at least to the end of December. I, you know, we're lacking a few months, but at least we have that. And then we can, you know, match that with the expected export pace, which gives us the remaining stocks at the end of the year. How, and that basically says how tight is it going to be because that changes the attitude towards pricing. And that of course carries into the new crop um, you know, ending stocks from last year is your carry-in, expected areas are the up or down, which gives us an idea of the forecast supply. And of course, we are guessing at yields at this point in time, and in general, we use average, and um, keeping in mind that it's dry right now. And we can do that for Canada and the competitors, and it gives us, uh, you know, we match that with the demand outlook and the timing of the demand uh, to some degree. And that should give us a picture as to is the price trend up or down? And what should the timing of the sales be a little bit? 
So we'll first talk about the 2020 lentil numbers of what's left. And as you know, um, uh, uh, Canadian acres um, were up um, by about 15% and production was up by 26%. So that was much talked about by the buyers early in the year last year, um, you know, as we eased from the summer into the fall. But really the truth of it was um, that supply was unchanged because of the lower carry-in from the previous year. You know, you can see we, we are counting only for 85,000 tons last year. So the big question already in the fall became, you know, what is the usage going to be and what are the exports going to be? And, um, uh, you know, the 2021 20, uh, year is this one here. And we are using 2.7 million tons exports uh, for the entire crop year, which would give us quite a low carry out of 185,000 tons. That's only a 6% stock use ratio. And as a rule of thumb, you know, when you see stock use ratios that are lower than 10%, it tends to tell you that the market is going to be fairly firm and you have a relatively low downside to prices actually. Um, so that's kind of an important benchmark to keep in mind. We should also point out that, um, you know, I, I have agriculture and food numbers contrasting ours a little bit here. They were not radically different, except until about uh, a month ago or so, or two months ago, they were still using 2.9 million tons of exports and uh, a different domestic use number. So that was a bit deceiving because we could never quite tell where we ship quite the 2.9 million tons to, nor did we have the supplies. And that can be quite deceiving. They have since come down to the 2.7 million uh, ton number as well. Um, particularly early in the year, I encourage people to look at production by type. So that's actually an, a balance sheet or a supply and demand sheet we did um, for last, for the ongoing crop year by type of lentil. And um, things have changed slightly um, from when we did that last. And it showed, that, er, showed us early on though that the stock use ratios were going to be tight uh, basically for all types of lentils. And, um, you know, we are even tighter on the small greens um, because they have been pulled up by the other varieties since. So early in the, start, in the crop year, that's fairly important to actually get an idea, you know, what our seeding actually was by type. In terms of export performance, as I mentioned, we only know the numbers for sure by destination to the end of December. Uh, these are the stat scan numbers. And um, here I'm showing you the lists of the major countries, and this is the 2021 year highlighted in, in, in uh, pink. And then I'm showing you shipped year to date, December. These are the firm numbers we have. And if we were to prorate the export pace that we had early in the, um, from August into December, you know, what would the exports be if we were able to maintain that pace? And it shows you that while we are using a 10.7 million ton number, that's the supplies we basically have. If you were to prorate the previous pace, you would actually end up with 2.9 million numbers. And maybe that's what AFC was doing. Um, I wanted to, I have highlighted in red the two most important countries and um, India and Turkey combined take about 51% of our lentils. So, you know, once you have a handle on those two destinations, you already know about where half our stuff goes. Um, if you add in the UAE and Bangladesh um, to that, then we are looking at about two thirds, 66, 67% of the, of, of the volume um, we know where that's going to go. So with respect to India, that took just shy of 400,000 tons, um, August to December. We are still using 850,000 tons for the entire crop year because we think they will have to buy some more lentils um, in the late spring or going into the summer. And um, so, you know, it's a very, very important number to watch, but again, and we'll talk about the weather and so on a little bit later, I, I think they will have to top up. On Turkey, we actually increased our forecast from 500,000 to 525 um, um, because of the very good demand in Iraq and in the Middle East, although that has been flattening off a little bit uh, in the last while. If you were to prorate them, it gets us to about 535,000 tons. Um, so to, to really, you know, the base numbers for the 2020 uh, crop lentils then are the small ending stock number, 6% stock use ratio, meaning that your risk for prices to fall radically is relatively small. 
although when we when we only have very few stocks left um, buyers also stop asking for it um, so i always say don't forget to price high prices um, and and we are at high price levels um, because at some point in time the markets really scales down recent prices have um, been uh, certainly very strong and because India is so important, I have a comment here on the government of India. And um, for the new lentil crop, they're actually still using 1.3 million tons, which would be an 18% increase over the previous year. Um, we think it's much more likely that um, India will have something like 1.1, 1.15 million tons. And, and we'll talk about whether in, in the next couple of slides. Um, we do have a better handle on the pigeon pea crops and, and some contacts that tell us that they are down by about 15% from the earlier estimates due to weather, but they are geographically a little bit different. Um, so it's one of the reasons we have taken their crop down a bit and, and why we think that they will have to buy some more later on. So um, in terms of recommendations, we think you should be sold out. Uh, old crop and start worrying about the new crop uh, at prevailing prices because these are very good prices indeed. So just a quick view at the harvest weather in India. So uh, on this slide here you see uh, a map of India and some of the um, rainfall data from January into the end of February. And you can see that there's um, uh, the eastern region where they've had unusually high or what they call a large excess of rain, 60% um, more than usual. And the problem with it, the, the actual rainfall is not that high, but it came um, um, very heavily. Um, and the two maps on the right hand side show you the growing areas for pigeon peas, which certainly fall into that area of heavier rainfall. And the major growing areas on this map here for lentils, which are affected to some degree, but certainly not all growing areas. So you have to be a little bit careful with some of these reports on, on the weather data in India and what it does to the crop. And so for good measure, um, here's again the rainfall data for India. And I also have a map here um, picturing the chickpea areas, um, which are in, in most of India. And you can see that the chickpeas might have been affected more so again than the lentils um, with the recent weather events. So that brings us to the 2021 crop considerations. Um, and I think here, you know, you have to worry about some of the domestic factors or take them into consideration as well as some of the international factors. This is a map of percent of precipitation uh, from normal from November to February 28th. And you can see that there's certainly some areas of concern, uh, certainly in Manitoba, but also in, in Saskatchewan and in Alberta. So these are things that you will have to take into consideration depending on your location. And then of course, you will look at the rotations and disease pressure. And where we from the marketing side get more into the action is the return per acre calculations, um, as well as the crop production outlook in terms of acres and so on. Um, and then there's exactly you know what uh, John already talked about earlier as well. And then we start worrying about the global competitive supply outlook uh, for commodity like lentils. What is Turkey going to do, Australia, and so on, and the demand trends for the commodity. And some of the geopolitical things, reliability of export destinations certainly applies to India as well. So here is a return per acre comparison. It's an average um, for Saskatchewan um, and you will, as always, have to adjust it to your own yields. Um, um, some of your um, uh, crop rotations certainly come in, into play here and so on. But just as a gauge, um, basis current prices, return per acre over full cost, which is always a luxury when you can do that and see a number of positive numbers. Green and red lentils at prevailing prices, new crop prices certainly fare very well. The only one uh, in that example that is much, much better is flaxseed, um, which is not a big area crop either. So we know that lentils are competitive uh, in terms of acres. And um, that leads us to believe that for the coming year, we will for sure see a 2% increase in acres, maybe a touch more. Of course, it depends what some of the other commodities are doing and um, 
canola has certainly been a hot item, uh, will more impact on the peas. Um, but uh, again, you know, some of the ergonomic things come into that as well. So in terms of the balance sheet here, I have highlighted the mercantile numbers with the red arrows. And for comparison's sake, I have put the agriculture and agri-food February numbers there as well um, for the last year and, and the new crop year. So assuming a 2% acreage increase in our case um, and uh, a 1,500 pound average yield to production, um, uh, you know, depending on the yields would be down slightly actually from last year and supply down by 1.4%. So the big question just like last year then becomes what can we expect from the export market? And um, I put here exports down 5% partly because it is going to be dependent a little bit on our production. If you're assuming for, for this coming uh, year, uh, 2.6 or 2.575 is my a number and exports, our carryout is actually going to increase slightly. And we will talk about the export destinations why I'm going down with that a little bit. In that case, the ending stocks would be up 45, but it's up from a very low level last year. Still a 9% stock use ratio, so relatively tight, but not as tight as in the previous year. Having said that, you know, I think pulses in general are well positioned um, in view of an increasing food shortage actually in certain areas of the world. So, you know, I wanted to put that out there as well. I'm, I'm certainly um, very positive on long run demand on, on lentils. And it is not even in this scenario supply push market, it's, it's more a demand driven market. So in terms of the export details, um, you know, I'm uh, highlighting here with the red arrow, the 21, 22 uh, demand picture. I went down a little bit on India um, because we do have some question marks on how that uh, uh, lentil crop in India will actually come in um, and how demand will be impacted by um, a little bit of loss on the pigeon peas and so on. So we're using 800,000 tons for the next year and 475 for Turkey. I went down a little bit on Turkey because as you know, the lentils we ship to Turkey are re-exported into the Middle East, um, in, primarily into North Africa and Iraq. And um, I have been told that while we saw almost a 50% increase in demand last year at this time and March forward because of COVID, it seems that some of the buyers there overbought a little bit and have stocks and have to to wear that down at first. And the increase in demand for pulses um, following the onset of COVID is there, but it's not as big as, as the initial peak. So we have to be a little bit careful on those demand numbers. Um, so with that, we also have to look at some of the global uh, trend in production for lentils, because we do, although we are fairly dominant, we do have competitors. And by our calculation, I'm showing you here global lentil production estimates. Um, we are going from about 6.7 million tons to 6.5 million tons this year, given average yields. And uh, you know, Canada is certainly very important here. We, we comprise about 45% of the 2021 production of total. India, another 17 to 20%, Australia, 9%, Turkey, 7%, and the US, 5%. So that gives you a scale as to how important the various production countries are. So if that calculation and the assumptions on yield are right, um, global production will actually be down slightly. Um, um, and that again, you know, is assuming that India is, is going to produce 1.1 million tons and not 1.3. Australia will have a more normal harvest. Uh, they had very good yields last year. Um, we do expect a bit of an increase in Turkey. And um, you know, we have a fairly good handle on that because some of them are fault seeded um, and a bit of a reduction in the United States. So that's how we come up with those numbers. So in terms of recommendations actually um, for the 2021 lentils um, as to what you should do actually in terms of prices, is that you, you should probably consider pricing um, uh, some green and some red lentils even at prevailing prices because it reduces your price risk and it allows you to cover some of your variable costs very early on in the year. Um, because there are some risks in terms of yields um, and also on the demand side. Um, 
Um, and then we would encourage you to set acreage targets uh, in terms of return on investment per acre so that you can execute when the prices uh, get close to that. Um, so it's going to be a very, very interesting year and uh, certainly we are off uh, to a very, very positive start on that and I sure hope that um, the agronomic conditions um, will also be accordingly. So with that, we'll move into the edible beans. And as I said earlier, edible beans, um, in terms of our position in the market, are very, very different. The major producers on edible beans, I don't know if you would be able to name them, but uh, Myanmar, India, Brazil, China, Tanzania, Uganda, not countries that we normally talk about. Uh, to US, it's kind of in there. You can see it on the slide here. Um, but Canada is not even on the scale because we produce about 320,000 tons, so are uh, relatively small. Global production is about 21.3 million, and of that, about 4.6 million tons are traded. So it's a very, very different market from the lentil side. Um, this gives you the same thing in numbers. Um, so you can see our position within global production. These are the 2020 numbers. So we make up about 1.6% of global production. So what that means is that we will be a price follower. You know, there's a bit of a North American market because we also import lentils from the United States, which is a bit of a geographic thing. Um, uh, you know, our cannas are located in the East and, and they will import um, certainly beans um, from the United States as well, but we're also an exporter. Um, and the bean market is also a very complex market because you have a whole range of types of beans uh, and varieties within that. So here I have a bit of a snapshot from some recent updates on, on the uh, bean markets from some different origins. And on the top left hand side, these are some comments. <clears throat> Um, on the speckled, on the kidney beans, basically, um, you know, and highlighting that the supply in China is rapidly decreasing. And we can add to that that while in the, uh, China used to be um, uh, one of the biggest exporters of beans, and also at one point in time, even in my career of lentils, um, their pulse production has been uh, successively diminished uh, because they're producing bigger crops like soybeans and corn and, and that is being encouraged there. Um, even within that spectrum, the 2020 harvest was down because of poor weather in northeast China and uh, their supply is insufficient to demand so they also have become an importer. Brazil also had a delayed harvest and a short supply and the same was true for Ethiopia. Um, down here, there's some highlights um, from Brazil. Uh, consumption there was up actually 12% last year, which had to do with COVID and some of the government support programs for the poorer population. Um, they produce a big bean crop, 2.8 million tons. Um, and, uh, you know, again, um, uh, they also import some beans, they import some black beans from Canada, for example. Um, but the movement to plant proteins there is actually diminishing some of the exports that they do on the bean side. And here on the right hand side, these are some of the challenges in the North American markets. Um, uh, prices certainly have moved up as well um, because of the factors mentioned earlier. And uh, it leads, uh, you know, it shows you also some of the prices in US dollars per ton. Um, that are being paid uh, now. Um, and, and they certainly think that there will be supply challenges on the edible bean side. So this as well has become a demand pull market. Um, in terms of Saskatchewan, again, you know, we're fairly small. Uh, additional considerations for you, certainly the agronomic fit and the time it takes uh, to husband them. them access to buyers and processing. You know, there are not a lot of processes of beans here and some of them actually shipped still um, east and access to market and towel is a difficulty as well. In terms of edible bean production by province, uh, this shows you the breakdown. Um, you know, Manitoba in terms of the prairie provinces um, has uh, over time become fairly important. We do 33% of the Canadian white beans and 44% of the Canadian colored beans uh, come from Manitoba. 
Saskatchewan, uh, shown down here in, in the red circle, 5% of the colored beans, and Alberta, 21% of the colored beans. Um, uh, you know, as you know, there's also um, you know some bean plants in southern Alberta as well, which might be accessible to you in Saskatchewan. There are some um, discernible trends on beans in Canada. Certainly, we are starting to be used uh, to put much more emphasis on colored beans versus white beans. And when you talk to the processors uh, and the canners uh, in Eastern Canada, um, they are shifting more and more into the colored bean side because of consumer demand. So there are some very significant uh, shifts in, in the overall bean acres between the types of beans over the last while. And you can look at the numbers when you review them later on. Um, what's also important is how does the supply chain work? Um, you know, uh, uh, we have listed um, a little bit of the supply chain here. You know, there are about 30 processors, but a lot of them are, in, um, you know, some in Manitoba, eight in Saskatchewan, three in Alberta. There are certainly canners there, and if you are a longer term bean grower, I encourage you to look at the domestic market. It seems to me, after having talked to them, that the canners are actually looking for some closer linkages with domestic suppliers. Very hard to get into, but um, you know, certainly it might be a longer run strategy. Um, and uh, when we did a survey last year for something uh, different on, on the major retailers, uh, they are certainly reporting that the purchases of beans and also the questions about local production and so on are increasing uh, basically for all of the retailers uh, here in, in Canada. So, you know, maybe there's a bit of an opening there. Um, our companies, um, our buyers on the prairies tend to ship 95% of it to export and, and tend to bypass the domestic market simply because it's relatively small. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time um, to develop it for about 5 to 6%, um, you know, of, of the offtake. So, um, in terms of processing and handling um, of beans in Saskatchewan, I made a quick list here for you. Um, if you're considering it, uh, that you might want to scan or contact them uh, in terms of the type of beans they're looking at. Um, here is um, pintos are one of the uh, major um, types of beans uh, in the US and Canada that are also traded between our two countries. And this gives you an idea of the Canadian and the US uh, pinto production. Um, and the black bar shows you the three average with about 510,000 tons. So again, you know, it's one of the larger types uh, handled here. And this table gives you a listing of the 2020 production by type. So pinto beans on tops, cranberries, navy beans, great northerns. Um, Great Northerns, by the way, are uh, some of the beans that we actually export into Turkey alongside with the lentils. Black beans, again, you know, into Brazil and so on. Um, um, so lumped between the United States and Canada, you know, it's about a 1.8 million ton production uh, in 2020. And we think that acres will be up moderately um, because especially in the States, there's a lot of competition by soybeans and corn in some of those areas. In terms of the Canadian numbers, again, you know, we are 1.6% of the global edible bean production. Uh, this gives you a, a summary and you can see um, that um, production was certainly up in the previous year. And we anticipate that to fall a little bit, partly to do with yield uh, and competition for acres. In terms of export numbers, we export about 365,000 tons. That's all types combined. And we import 75,000 tons annually. These are the canners um, in Eastern Canada that buy that primarily from the United States. Our kidney beans so go primarily to the United Kingdom, small rats primarily to Japan. And, um, you know, uh, the others, it's, it's a range of countries, including, as I mentioned, Greece, France, and Turkey. So um, to make a breakdown of the exports is almost impossible because Stats Canada does not keep export data by type. So uh, in terms of an outlook, edible ending stocks are minimal around the world. Um, uh, it's a little bit different here, but in, um, in, in terms of world stocks, they're actually quite diminished. Uh, demand has been increasing with COVID and changing an eating pattern as well. 
and uh, prices have come off the high from last summer, um, but there has been some recovery recently um, because of the stock drawdown. And uh, you know, I'm giving you the range of prices for the various types here um, to maybe start your return per acre calculations if you're looking at this crop. So with that, um, we'll swing into the soybean data. And again, you know, soybeans uh, um, on in Saskatchewan are different again than the lentils because um, from a provincial point of view, we're a very small um, supplier, but we have to follow the world markets. And um, um, soybeans globally are quite tight because of high demand by China. Um, uh, basically, China is, is buying feed grains um, from all over the world. Um, the soybeans are bought both for their um, vegetable oil supply and also um, meal is very, very important in their hog rations. Um, we will look at, um, uh, I have a table actually kind of showing you the size of the various suppliers. Uh, US is very important in that market. And there I only want to highlight, they have a very, very small um, ending stock outlook, 120 million bushels, and that's the lowest ever projected in February. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's again, going to be relatively tight here. Um, and when we look at the exports, um, export shipments have already reached, already reached 96% of the US export number with seven uh, months of the season remaining. Now there's a bit of a, or a lot of seasonality in that because normally in March, we see a lot of Brazilian beans already coming on stream, but their harvest is late. And, and so there's been a lot of pressure on US shipments. Um, there's still a lot of questions on the South American crop. You've probably followed that. That's um, Brazil and Argentina. Uh, there's some questions about the weather effects and the size of their crop um, this year. Um, in terms of the outlook for the coming year, soybean acres are projected up uh, almost by 7 million acres in the United States. Um, certainly there's still a tug of war going on between soybean acres and corn acres. Um, but it will definitely go up uh, to nine to a higher number and, and USDA is using 19 million acres. Um, ending stocks for next year to jump to that um, are forecast to increase a little bit, but still will remain historically low, low relative to the projected use. So even with the big increase in plantings in the US to 90 million acres, it would give them around 145 million bushel carry out and that would still keep prices high. So, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a very, very positive story that has also certainly um, supported the canola side of things. So this gives you the global context. So on the left hand side, you're seeing global soybean production by major producers. So here we have Brazil, United States, Argentina, China, India, Paraguay, and this is Canada on top here. So again, you know, relatively small player. Um, um, and, uh, you know, 20, uh, 21 supplies were up. Um, but on this side, I'm showing global crush, which has been trending up for the last 15 years, basically. And again, you know, China, a, a very, very big factor here. And this is US crush. You won't see Canada listed in here because we actually crush very few soybeans. We have a bigger canola crush, but do very little on the soybean side. Just to, so just, you know, to look at the size, we have 360 million ton production uh, globally um, versus about 322 million ton crush. Just a reminder, Marlene, we've got five minutes left here. Okay. So um, Canadian soybean balance sheet, um, supply is forecast to go up 2022 year to 7.6 million tons, but exports will go up, go up accordingly and we are forecasting that the carryout stocks will be very, very small. Um, so uh, exports are not the problem. Um, uh, and in, in, uh, in effect, you know, exports have been going up. It is difficult to export soybeans from uh, Saskatchewan sometimes simply because it's a volume question. We produce relatively few and it's um, very hard to make the volume shipments work that, that would be required for such a bulk commodity. 
So this is a breakdown of um, production by province. You can see the biggest province by far Ontario, followed by Manitoba and Quebec and Saskatchewan down here. So it's, it's really a volume question. And unfortunately, the world prices are heavily discounted at the elevator in Saskatchewan uh, for some of those reasons. So there's no problem with demand. Um, and uh, the forecast, the outlook, um, is, is quite positive uh, on the soybean market. And um, given the <clears throat> PNW, the Pacific Northwest soybean values at X point point, I can tell you that we could work, should work back um, uh, soybeans to 1650 at the elevators, definitely. And the new crop outlook, um, you know, I would say we would be looking for around $14 a bushel, which are very, very good values indeed. And um, so I think I'm right on time, Andrea. So um, with that, I turn it back over to you. Uh, thanks, Marina. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us regarding lentils, soybeans, and the driving market. Uh, we'll now open up to a question and answer session here with John and Marina. Just a reminder, type your question into the question box at the, on your dashboard and, and uh, Amber will help address those questions. Amber? Thank you. <clears throat> and there is still time to get your questions in, so feel free to continue to submit those as we work through the Q&A period here. Uh, John, we've got quite a few questions regarding peas, so maybe we'll, we'll start there. Um, first question is, what quantity of imports of Canadian yellow peas by China do you have penciled in for 2021, higher or lower than the 2.9 million tons China imported in 2020 from Canada? Um, yeah, so I think for 2021, um, I'd have to double check and see what exactly our number is, but I think probably in aggregate, at this stage of the game, it'd be similar forecasting a, a similar a similar import demand from uh, from from China. Uh, having said that, I guess the one the two parts I guess that make us a little ca make us a little cautious, I guess. One is if they do end up uh, actually uh, uh, paving the way for more imports to come in from Ukraine. Potentially, that could displace some some Canadian demand. Uh, the other part, as well, is the extent to which uh, the extremely strong uh, uh, protein meal and feed market is also helping uh, helping draw some Canadian peas in. So those are areas that I guess I would say there's maybe some vulnerability. Uh, having said that, you know both of those uh, aren't necessarily going to uh, uh, displace a bunch of Canadian demand. Perhaps that just continues the the, the overall demand growth. So at this stage of the game, I would say probably flattish, uh, but watching those two factors uh, as well as, as areas where, you know, potentially that's where might possibly be some risk. And we're, um, can I, may I add to that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, please do, Marlene. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Um, in, in this uh, outgoing year, 2020, um, China imported, I think it was 2.95 million tons of peas from all origins. And I think um, something like 97 or 98% of those are from, from Canada. Um, and the reason, and their target had kind of been 3 million tons. The only reason it was less um, uh, was basically some transportation problems later in the year. And, and that's an area of concern in general because freight price freight values have gone up and the transportation problems, especially with containers, are accelerating right now. It's something that, that we need to keep a very, very close eye on. So for next year, when I asked uh, some of the compounders if they would be looking at Canadian peas again, and they said absolutely, um, as long as they compare with soybean meal. So that's really kind of our gauge. And the protein content in peas relative to soybean uh, protein content is actually quite cheap still. So that, that should be working. Um, so uh, unless there are some political problems, which we never know, and John was mentioning that, we should not have a problem uh, in exporting peas. And, and they have already purchased about half a million tons for post-harvest um, shipments, um, which may allow us to get the peas in early again before the other commodities become hot. So I think it looks um, fairly positive, but it it always is a pricing question as well when you when you talk about the feed market. Great, thank you to both of you. Um, John, uh, 
have you seen, um, this is kind of both a production and market question, but um, do other major pea producing countries deal with root rot problems similarly to what we're seeing here in Canada? Yeah, no, appreciate the question. And, and uh, in, the, in the spirit of transparency, uh, I'll say we cheated a little bit because I was texted this question ahead of time. And so there was uh, Sherry Ellen Phelps uh, provided some some comments on this on the agronomic side. And, and so she had mentioned that uh, uh, this is actually an issue that uh, that some other countries that have been have been dealing with for a while, particularly maybe in some of the areas where it's been a little less arid. So so that is a, a worldwide challenge. And, and so uh, that's not not unique to us. Um, maybe the one comment I would maybe add on that uh, from a, you know, kind of, I guess, from a bit of a market perspective and so forth is, you know, a lot of these other countries, they generally have not pushed their pulse rotations as aggressively as we maybe have in Western Canada in, in some regions. And, and in a lot of cases, maybe pulses are a relatively smaller portion of the overall uh, acreage mix. So in that sense, you know, perhaps... Uh, it might be less of an issue in that sense if, if uh, you know, if, if uh, pulse acres are a little bit smaller as a share of the total pie, and uh, and maybe the rotations aren't pushed as much. But but it's not unique to us, uh, certainly. At least that's what Carrie uh, um, Lynn was was saying, and and uh, that that would make sense, I think, from our perspective. Great, thanks, John. Um, this question, uh, maybe to Marlena, uh, do you feel the India import restrictions will extend for months or years? Can they produce enough for, for their consumption solely? And I think this is probably focused on lentils. Um, it might be focused on peas because that's where you have the quotas and, uh, uh, you know, all the restrictions. And I think on peas, um, it's a little bit of a different case than lentils. Their ambition, of course, is to feed themselves with all pulses, but they will not be able to do that um, for a while, I think. Although, you know, the yields are in, inching up as well. Um, but peas are threatening to them because peas are the cheapest pulse, and it disturbs their minimum um, support price scheme with chickpeas. And so I agree with John in that they will probably maintain the restrictions on, on peace, certainly into the coming year. And we have had the good fortune that China more than picked up the slack. Um, lentils are a different story and um, the lentil production is relatively smaller. And, you know, as I said, I feel um, they might ease restrictions or, or the tariff um, uh, in when they need it. And we expect that in the summertime that they will need some more lentils. And again, the pigeon pea question comes into that. If they did indeed lose 15% because of the weather, um, that helps particularly our green lentil exports because there will be a substitution for the missing pigeon peas. So it's, it's really something that you have to look at on a commodity by commodity basis, uh, keeping in mind what it does to the domestic pricing because they're getting more and more sensitive on that. And keep in mind, they had a lot of farmer protests there this year, so they will be monitoring that very carefully. Great, thank you. Um, back to John. Um, is Chinese demand for yellow peas uh, more so due to fractionation in human protein products or more feedstocks and animal consumption? You know, I, I think most of it is more so on the on the human side. I, I think maybe where we'll, we're getting, uh, let's just say some some additional incremental demand or at least a, a supportive influence is certainly like the, the, the feed side has definitely been helping. And, and I think as, as uh, Marlena mentioned here earlier, is, is, as long as Pea is a peas as a protein source are relatively cheap, which they are. Then certainly that is that is going to help draw on those those additional supplies, and in particularly in a market that is as tight as it is globally for soybeans and soybean meal. Uh, but but I do believe you know long term it is at its core uh, uh, human consumption that is that is going to be a, a key driver, and and that'll be the largest part of it. But but certainly that uh, certainly that feed side is is definitely helped in this current environment, and and uh, will help underpin pea prices and, and help add to that into that demand of coal so it's 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 certainly certainly an important important part of it but uh but yeah certainly you know their chinese demand for peas had been increasing even even for example when uh, uh their overall soybean soybean meal imports are down when their swine herds took a setback because of uh, asf and so forth you know they were still buying significant number of volumes of peas it's only sort of cranked up since then so um, uh, largely human driven, but definitely that feed component is, is there at the right price and, and, a, and a, great, uh, a great additional part of the, the demand pull. 
Great, thank Can you. Can I add a number actually? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I would say that probably around 600,000 tons of a fractioning. So that's for the starch side, for the vermicelli noodles, and they also actually export protein, you know, uh, one from the piece. So that's maybe something we should try to take over <laughs> as all our fractioning plants come in. Um, and that demand has certainly been growing, and there's uh, certainly a growing demand for green peas, which helped our um, green pea market very um, uh, materially in the last five years or so, um, more for snack foods and, and such things. So that's the edible market. Um, it's just uh, what I call the slush fund demand. You know, we, our pea production has been going up, and without that extra um, uh, tonnage, basically doubling the tonnage on the feed side, um, because we lost India, um, we would actually be having a sizable carryout without China and the feed demand. So it's become equally important almost. And it allows us to ship in bulk vessels. Um, and we already ship canola actually into those destinations. So it's um, a unique fit for us. Um, and, and the one th threat that I mentioned, forgot to mention earlier actually, is that, um, and John was alluding to it as well, is that the Ukrainian Pulse Federation is working very hard to actually gain access to China. Uh, and they're hoping to have it in place. It's a question of phytosanitary certificates and so on. They have that in place by September, which would be you know, a new crop. Um, it's their production is not such that it would really threaten us a lot but in the long term i think that's something we have to keep an eye on as well so. yeah that's a great point thanks marlena um this next question um I'll, I'll throw to maybe both of you to speak to if you have any thoughts um the question is do you believe that fertilizer prices will have an impact on pulse acres this spring mm. I'm not sure if I'm well equipped for that. Um, I doubt it actually, because farmers are fairly well on average, uh, are well financed this year. Um, prices have been good and the volume shipped, as I mentioned earlier, is up. So they actually have been able to convert more of their crop into money. So I don't think that would be a major factor. What do you think, John? No, I, I think I would tend to agree with you, Marlena, and, and I, I think, yeah, particularly with grain prices high, not that fertilizer input costs, you know, don't, don't matter. I mean, they they obviously are part of that equation, but uh, but maybe less so. And, and I think certainly there was a, you know, the markets and prices are giving a strong incentive to to increase pulse acres, but but they're giving that for all crops, you know, and and so uh, I I think to the extent fertilizer prices going up, and, and again, I, I think from a farmer perspective, again, there's rotations. Uh, a lot of these decisions maybe were already, if not etched in stone, certainly well on their way prior to fertilizer prices running up. Fertilizer gets pre-booked. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of dynamics that would dilute maybe the, you know, the, the real run-up in fertilizer prices more recently. So I, I would agree with Marlene. I, I don't think it would have a huge impact, maybe at the minimum around the margins a little bit. But I, I think a lot of that gets, gets diluted by other factors that would be more important ultimately determining what, uh, what gets put in the ground. All right, great. Um, one more question on peas here. Um, John, specifically with regards to your presentation, there was a question on um, if you had a slide that looked to green pea pricing uh, similarly to the, what you had on yellow peas and maybe um, you can just speak to green pea pricing overall and, and we can always follow up with additional slides if we need to. Oh yeah, and and I can uh, I can share a slide after the fact on that as well, or or slide one in into the presentation. And and I'm wondering if they're, they're looking specifically at the at that ten year price one, maybe that I, I looked at. And and yeah, I guess quite frankly, you know, green pea prices are a little lackluster uh, from a historical perspective. I mean, they've been get pulled higher a little bit more recently, and again, sort of dragged. Uh, uh, almost from underneath, if you will, by by yellows into those markets around the margins that that uh, aren't as particular about which type specifically feed and, and maybe a few a few others. Uh, but from a longer term perspective, it's it's definitely a bit of a bit of a lackluster uh, uh, price in terms of that historical perspective. And so uh, it'll be you know pretty pretty average at best. But I I can include a specific I can include a specific slide. Maybe I'll slide it into the presentation or, or share that after the fact if, if someone's interested in in those details specifically. But uh, but certainly not in those lofty ranges by any stretch from what we we saw with yellows specifically in terms of you know for example what percentage from historical value and so forth. 
Great, thank you. Um, this question I may open up to either of you. Um, the question is, why are we not seeing $16 peas if they compare so closely to soybeans? Um, because the composition of peas is different. Uh, they have different protein content and different uses. So, um, you know, you have the oil component um, uh, that's used for vegetable oil on the soybeans and vegetable oil prices are relatively high. Um, so while, you know, in our case, we sometimes compare uh, the, the protein on a, and work out the percentage basis, um, the composition is different and the use is different. So the end use of, of the entire um, seed. So um, you wouldn't be able to compare them one to one. You have to compare them relatively to what they represent, what the components represent in the market. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with what Marlena said, and and I think maybe the one one other factor that that might also come into play a little bit as well is is just the ability to to source it in in volume consistently over a long period of time. And if you think about, for example, like like you know large feed producers, you know they don't want to be changing rations or they want to kind of keep it simple. And sometimes the ability just to be able to source you know massive volumes of soy meal, uh, which you know is is multiple times larger than than, than peas from a feed perspective, you know, sometimes there's elements of that that just make it a little simpler and, and easier to to do that rather than, uh, um, you know, sort of peas which are smaller and, and a little more incremental in terms of, of where they fit in. And so that's where, you know, that might that might also come into play a little bit too. So yeah, I think for a host of reasons, you, you can't really do a sort of a straight dollar per dollar comparison, for example, between, uh, uh, you know, between peas and and meal or or other feed components, it's it, there's there's various other factors that play into that as well. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a chickpea question next, uh, so maybe we'll send that to John. Uh, what are what are different market destinations for the different chickpea sizes? We're seeing some demand for medium to small kabuli chickpeas right now. Should farmers be thinking about smaller kabuli or larger kabuli demand for new crop? Yeah, I guess for new crop, and, and I guess, you know, there's so much that has to play out yet for, uh, you know, in terms of, of where some of the production is in some of the other regions. I mean, you know, certainly a country like Mexico with their production ramping up a little bit, they'd be tend to more so on the larger sizes a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I think also depends a little bit in terms of what gets planted in, in Russia. So uh, they tend to be a little bit more some of the smaller sizes. So I, I guess, you know, in terms of that breakdown between the various sizes, you know, maybe it's as much a little bit of a function of, of how things play out in some of our key key exporting regions. And so that's a little bit difficult to, to say. I mean, you know, the fact that we're kind of a, we're such a small exporter on the on the broader scale, we're almost more sort of, you know, filling in holes per se, rather than uh, rather than sort of being dominant in one market to the next. So to be honest, I, I guess I don't have a strong opinion on, on uh, you know, larger, large sizes relative to smaller sizes. Uh, in terms of one that would be relatively better than than the other, to 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 be quite honest, I don't know, Marlena, if, if you got an opinion about between the relative sizes and, and how that maybe shapes up for the coming year, but uh, you know, I, I think in my opinion, at least a big part of it will be how production plays out some of these overseas markets that we're ultimately competing against. But but the fact that we are more of a residual exporter in so many of these markets, you know, means we're we're uh, you know less dominant compared to other countries that grow so much more than we do. But I don't know, Marlene, if you got some additional, more specific thoughts on, on the relative sizes for, for the coming season. Uh, it seems definitely that it's tightest for the large sizes and, and we don't, you know, we do very few of the large sizes actually. <clears throat> um, and the um, Mexican crop is not as good as expected. So I think I would expect that the large sizes carry the biggest bat, relatively speaking, on on. And then there's a question uh, on demand. Some of the smaller sized Kabuli types, they go into the States um, for um, the hummus market. And that has been quite curtailed because the hospitality industry isn't functioning with COVID. And I think that's why you see some of the smaller Kabuli types um, not getting the same price boost as we see on the larger ones. So it's also a question of demand and, and what is functioning in the COVID environment and what isn't. And, and you're right, you know, Russia has more of the, the smaller Kabulis. And then we have had very good competition on the Desley side by Australia, who had that extraordinarily good crop. Um, so the biggest bang is for the largest size, which are the most difficult to produce for us. 
So on the agronomic side, I'm not so sure how how well that works for us. But from a market point of view, the bigger the better. <laughs> great. No, those are some great answers. Um, we don't have too much else left in the Q and A section here, and we've got a few moments left. So maybe are there any closing thoughts from from either of you as we sort of wrap up here today? Go ahead, John. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, well, first of all, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, some good questions that came through maybe rounded out some, uh, some, some of the discussion, but, but no, I, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add. I, I mean, I, I think from, uh, you know, I think Marlena made a great point in her presentation too, about the fact that prices are so high, uh, you know, and then I think farmers just want to be, you know, taking advantage of that. And as much as, you know, outlook maybe is tight and looks friendly and so forth. I mean, I think we also, there's an element of, of managing risk and, you know, markets always look most bullish at the top, you know, and, and so uh, I, I think, I think the prospects continue to look favorable for, you know, for peas and for lentils and for a lot of these markets, but, uh, but we also got to be cognizant of, of some of the risks. And, and uh, again, I think about something like peas and, and the heavy reliance on China and, and that's great when things are going well, but we've seen in other markets that, that, you know, sometimes that can, that can surprise us, but uh, um, you know, it's, uh, I think overall the environment is favorable for, for all crop markets. Uh, the fact that I don't think that, for example, peas or soybeans or corn, those are balance sheets aren't going to be easily fixed this coming year unless you have phenomenal weather. So there is also a little tailwind from, from just crop markets in general, which, which also helps, you know, and, and so, you know, I, but but it, it's, a, it's an exciting time, you know, the domestic processing increasing in, in various, you know, dynamics, logistics and so forth, which might be a headwind or tailwind, how they shake out. It's going to be exciting. So I think growers will, you know, can be optimistic, but also be cognizant of, of managing risk and being aware of, of just the broader environment that can change very quickly, as we've seen over the past 12 months. So that would be maybe just some, some final thoughts I have. Thanks, Marlena. I, I think it's one of these years that you have a few times in your career where you have tremendous opportunities in, in that, you know, I'm thinking back to 2008, how many people sold canola at the then highest price ever? And we have surpassed that actually last week or 10 days ago. Um, so it's an environment that, that's very positive and um, we sometimes get a little bit like cluster in thinking about the marketing because you have these high prices in front of your eyes and you think it's definitely going to be a stellar year and so on. So I agree, you know, we now have to look after the agronomic side and get the crop established and seeded and all that. But keep an eye on the markets. And one thing I encourage also, which we have done in our market letter in the last little while is have long run um, 2015 or 10 year graphs in there that show you how far we have come since last fall, for example, on a canola but also on some of our pulse crops and how high we are historically. And then the question begs, how much higher can you go? And would you like to secure some of those returns? Because we have some very unusually high um, uh, contract possibilities with some companies. So if you want to reduce your price risk, you know, at a price that guarantees your return, you might want to contemplate a certain percentage at that. We don't want to oversell because the prospects are very good. Um, but when you look at the major commodity markets, which tend to be a little bit of a lead, you know, we are teetering a little bit right now if we can go even higher or if, if that's, you know, what the market can bear. Um, so keep that in mind. And as I tried to say in the presentation, keep an eye on the numbers. You know, when we, after seeding, you know, how do the crops look, not only here, but around the world, some of the competitive crops that we tried to allude to in the presentations. And then how is the export pace? You know, are we seeing the big bang that we saw last year? And, and also let's do some domestic homework. Let's make sure we keep the transportation going. You know, we have long said in our company, if you give us the rail, we will use it and it will increase our exports. It's not only the demand side, it's how we harness our supply chain and how available it is when we need it. You know, the railroads will always tell you, well, you ship the same every year, so it doesn't matter when, what time of the year we give it to you, that's not true. And this year is great proof. We are what, what did I say, 37% ahead of last year's. You know, let's make sure we keep that up. You know, right now we're running into problems, major inland problems with containers and so on. Um, you know, rail cars are becoming a little more scarce again. Let's make sure that that doesn't prevent us from participating in the markets that are quite obviously there.
and uh, given that i think it's it's a positive outlook and we should enjoy that year and and as i said try to make the most of it it comes three or four times in your career that's for sure Great. Well, thank you to both of you. I think we had some great discussion here today. I will pass things over to Brad just for some final closing thoughts. Well, I'd like to uh, thank, on behalf of our board, I'd like to thank Jonathan, Marina, and uh, Amber as well for your time and and the timely updates we've got today. It's it's great great insight going into the into the spring season. Also, a big thanks to Redhead Equipment for sponsoring today. And next week's session will be on focus on dry bean production, agronomy, and variety. So if you haven't registered yet, visit the saspulse.com website and you'll find the registration link under the events tab. I'd like to thank everybody for their time today and, and have a great day. See you later. <laughs>